Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Young. I'm on the Council of the, uh, of the Geological Society, and I'm very glad to be able to welcome you to the first of our 2017 series of London Lectures. Um, and this is the first lecture in the series under our new annual theme, which this year is Risk. Uh, and today's talk is entitled Risk and Uncertainty in Exploration for Oil and Gas, and it's to be delivered by Malcolm Brown, our president. Now, the assessment of risk in geological terms is something that uh, it lies very much at the heart of the work of many of us as, as, uh, of us as professional geologists. Uh, most commonly, perhaps, we think of risk in terms of danger to people or property. Um, and this is particularly very much the case for those of us who work in the engineering geology or contaminated land area. We're concerned, for example, with ground stability and foundations, the, the safety of foundations. We're concerned with uh, mapping contaminated land and its health effects. Uh, we may be concerned with the geological effects of flooding, uh, and we may be concerned with earthquakes and, volca earthquakes and volcanoes and a host of other geohazards, as we call them. Uh, and you'll be hearing about some of these other risks and geohazards uh, later in the series, later in the year. Uh, and the concept of risk, of course, is very much also a financial concept. And here, too, geologists have a very important role uh, in assessing and mitigating risk and reducing levels of financial exposure, particularly in, uh, when planning and developing large infrastructure projects uh, and, of course, in exploration, as we shall hear about tonight. In the case of oil and gas, the fundamental requirements for the entrapment of oil and gas uh, are the presence, of course, as you know, of a mature soy source rock, uh, a migration pathway for hydrocarbons, and a trap uh, comprising a porous or permeable and permeable reservoir rock with a seal. And once formed, however, these traps may be destroyed or leak, and when prospects are analysed and assessed by explorationists, they're concerned with estimating or calculating the overall chance of success of a well if it's drilled in a certain place. Uh, however, there is always a risk that these estimates uh, are wrong uh, uh, due to the uncertainty of the information that they're based on. Uncertainty continues, of course, uh, when hydrocarbons are found in a, an exploration well, because then further appraisal wells have to be drilled uh, under a multi-billion pound program to develop a field. Um, uh, and this, of course, carries a large degree of uncertainty about it. And uncertainty doesn't stop there. There are many other sources of risk and uncertainty associated with the exploration process, fluctuations in the oil price, varying government tax regimes, uh, political stability, and so on. Now, Malcolm Brown, our speaker tonight, is no stranger to these issues, and he's very well placed to tell us about them. He graduated from Kingston, and he worked for many years in Libya and Saudi Arabia before completing an MSc in petroleum geology at the Imperial College. He worked at British Gas, or the BG Group, as we now know it, for most of his career, uh, and, and saw it evolve from a state-owned utility to the successful international business that it is today. Uh, recently, uh, Malcolm has been the Executive Price Vice President for Exploration and has led BG's global exploration program for most of the last two decades, um, uh, and amongst, among, uh, during which the company was successful in making 16 giant gas discoveries. Malcolm is a former chair of the Petroleum Group of the Society, and he received the Petroleum Group's medal in 2011. Uh, he sits on the advisory board of... Energy Geoscience International, and also of the Sustainable Gas Institute at Imperial College. And he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Kingston University, his alma mater, in 2007. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our president, Malcolm Brown, to talk to us. Good evening, um, and welcome. 
I hope today to give you a little bit of a, an insight into, I suppose, how we in the oil and gas industry think about risk and uncertainty. We think about them in sort of two sort of different categories. They're not. It's, it's just easier to think about it in that, in that, that way in many ways. Whenever I come to these lectures, I guess what I enjoy is, is hearing about what somebody else in some other part of geology does all day. Actually, what do you do? What are the issues you face and everything else? I find this really fascinating because I've worked in one area for most of my career, but it means I know about this much, and there's another you know, 90% of other jobs out there that I know nothing about, which I always find good. So hopefully I can tell, um, to tell you a bit about what we do in the oil and gas business. And I'm sure you probably think it's, it's, it's really straightforward. Oil company drills for oil, successful most of the time, and um, life is easy, and we make lots of money. And unfortunately, it's not like that at all, and it's been very tough recently. But, um, and in many ways, it's, um, our success rate as explorers has decreased in recent times, which is an interesting sort of conundrum which we're sort of thinking about at the moment. The good thing about it being so hard is it makes it really, really interesting. So it's fantastic work to be in. I've really enjoyed myself. It's like a detective story, and, and the story started probably 200 million years ago. So you've got to work your way through from when things were first deposited, what happened in all that time, and what's the, what's the rare chance of finding a trap that's still intact, because most hydrocarbons actually just leak and um, leak it to surface over, over millennium, millenniums. Um, the average success rate is probably less than 25%, and if you think about that, so three out of four things we do don't work. So here we are working in a business whereby you're trying to provide a steady supply of energy, you keep the lights on, allow people to drive to work, pay dividends on shares, pay taxes, and three quarters of what you do it doesn't work. So you've got to sort of try and think through, gosh, how many times did you try then to make all this actually sort of come together? So I'm going to start with a very simple question, and we're going to come back to this at the end. So hands up in the audience if you think oil is overpriced or underpriced at the moment. So overpriced? I won't take offence, it's okay. <laughs> Only two people think it's overpriced and underpriced. God, what a fantastic bunch you are. So, and we'll come back and find out whether you're right later, okay? So, and I must apologise to all you. I have one equation in this whole thing, so, but it's quite a simple one. So, um, acknowledgements. A lot of this stuff came out of BG Group, which I was at um, for many years. We were very successful. We were obviously too, too successful. We were taken over by Shell last year. Um, and many of my colleagues now work there. So thanks to all those people, thanks to Alice Gulliford for making the presentation and Wood McKenzie for the fiscal charts. So the presentation outline, this looks a bit complicated, but we're going to have a safety moment in the, in, in a, in a, in the next slide. Then we're going to go through the sort of key ingredients, a bit about life cycle, basin analysis, prospect generation. Then actually when you think you've got a prospect, what do you do? Or when, you, when you think you've got somewhere that's worth exploring, what do you do? Go through exploration programs, appraisal and talk a bit about above-ground risk and, un and uncertainty. So, safety moments. You, you may be surprised to know that most major oil companies, we have a safety moment before starting most presentations, which is often just one slide talking about um, an aspect of safety. And why is that the case? I think we work with an inherently hazardous product which requires continual respect, attention, and an absolute safety focus. And we think about it all the time because it's necessary to think about it all the time. All companies have got a zero harm um, target. Um, we don't ever hit that zero harm, but actually we are probably much better at it than most other industries. I think worldwide oil and gas, in all the countries you can think of, has got a fatality rate half that of the UK construction industry, which is a very regulated business in a regulated country. Um, so a huge focus on leadership and commitment, risk management, operational incident readiness. And safety moments are often just about driving to work or things at home or whatever it is. Make people think about things and keep it in the forefront of your mind. Because if you don't, bad things can happen. So this is Macondo, and I wouldn't ever make this talk without talking about the worst disaster the oil industry has had in, in the recent decade, because we should talk about it. This is what can happen when things go wrong and mistakes are made. So on the 20th of April 2010, there was a blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, 11 crew members lost their lives, 17 people were injured. And I think these are the things we all have to remind ourselves can happen when mistakes are made and things go wrong. It's, it's, a, it's an inherently ha hazardous um, material which we actually work with. So the life cycle of an oil and gas field. I mean, this is, I suppose, can often be 50 years. I mean, 50 years when it works. Um, no time at all when it doesn't work. 
Um, we might, might cut things off very soon, because what you're trying to do is invest the, the limited money you have in the things which you've got most chance of working. So you're trying to reduce risk all the time by using the best science you've got and the best geologist you've got as well. So through the whole thing, exploration may take five to ten years, um, depending on how lucky you are, how soon, or whether you're unlucky altogether. Development may take another five years of studies, and then actually, you know, actually building the project may take two or three years too. Production might last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Some of the North Sea fields have gone on that long. And many of those fields now are going into the decommissioning phase, which you'll read about in the papers. And, um, and that's going to take two or three years, probably per big platform or whatever. And that will be a major industry, actually, because um, there's 100 odd platforms out there in the North Sea which are you know, slowly but sure, surely running out of oil um, to produce. But actually produce for much longer than people ever um, said they would do in general. I'm going to talk about the exploration phase. So in the introduction, um, we were talking about what are, the, what are the ingredients you must have. Well, clearly a source rock, we are including a complex organic carbon, kerogen, uh, and that over time will actually, with burial and heat and pressure, will break down to form hydrocarbons. This may be um, a clay. It may be something like the Kimmeridge clay in Dorset would be the best one you would know. Jurassic Age oil prone source rock, which you can see there, see in Yorkshire. Um, it produces most of the oil in the North Sea, quite a lot of the gas in the northern North Sea as it's been cracked to, to, to make gas. Down south, we have the coal measures, carboniferous age, um, gas prone source rock, source of all the gas. And if you think about it, wherever you see carboniferous, it made the same amount of gas as we had trapped in the southern North Sea, but most of it actually just went straight to surface at some time or other in the past. So wherever you see coal measures, it wasn't as though there wasn't gas, there was gas. So I think a lot of people outside geology just think that actually it's only the you know, oil and gas ever found, we found it, it was trapped. No, actually the vast majority was never trapped, it, it leaked to surface. This is just normal part of the planet's um, cycle. So when we think about going into a new basin, I mean to me I always think source is the most important thing of this, of the whole sort of source equation. If I've got source, I can chase around for reservoirs and see whether I can make something work because I've got something worth chasing for. If I haven't got source, then, then you're wasting your time, so stop. So you're thinking about source presence, SP, and you're thinking about source effectiveness as well. There's two different things. There is no point having a source if it was never mature and um, it never created hydrocarbons in the first place. So it's the presence and it's the effectiveness which is key, uh, which you're looking for first of all. But once you've established that source rock, you can really reduce that criteria in your equation to improve your chance of success. Now, on reservoirs, <coughs> excuse me, all we really want, and maybe I'll just differentiate between conventional and unconventional exploration here at the moment. In conventional exploration, which I'm going to focus on, the hydrocarbons move from the source rock into a reservoir rock. In unconventionals, which are, say, shale gas, shale oil, the things you have to frack for, have to do reservoir stimulation for, the hydrocarbons never, generally never left or didn't all leave the source rock. So you're actually going in and taking you know, your, your source rock is your source and your reservoir in many ways. And the only reason that that's possible is by advance, ad, advances in reservoir stimulation. That's what made that possible in the last 10 years, um, which didn't happen before. So in conventional exploration, so we have reservoir rocks, so they can be clastic, they can be sandstones, they can be carbonate. They could be numerous different facies. What you want, you want porosity, you want spaces between the pores, and what you want is permeability allowing to flow into the, into the reservoir in the first place, and then when you drill a well in it, to, to allow you to take the hydrocarbons out. Now, key things about this, you know, you drill a well and you, you, know, and you think, fine, I may have found a wonderful Rotligander's desert, um, Aeolian sandstone, nice and thick, continuous, fantastic, you know. And that's all good stuff. I think as you may not have done, you may have found a sort of tidal bar, which is going to be long and skinny. So how big is your prospect? How much of it has got reservoir over? If you drilled a well and you found the bar, great. But how soon does it shale out into a deep water facies or become a, a terrestrial facies on the other side? So what is the variation on your reservoir thickness, effectiveness? So if you don't know the facies, you're likely to find something different next time you drill. So you've got to understand that through your original mapping and what you find in your first well. And the last thing, of course, is what happened to your reservoir 
in the interim, in the, in the 100 million years in between when it was deposited and you looking for oil and gas now. And that diagenesis happens, and diagenesis is really caused by the flow of fluids through, uh, through reservoir rocks, which happens all the time. It can be silica rich, it can be calcium carbonate rich, but it will generally decrease your porosity, decrease your permeability, and make your reservoir worse. So, you know, once upon a time, you might think, well, 10,000 feet is my economic floor. Anything deeper than that doesn't work. These days, it can be better because we have better completion technology, we have better stimulation technology. But overall, the deeper it is, the worse it is. And I suppose a different thing, actually, is carbonates at times, diagenesis can actually make them better. In that we, for example, we've had these big discoveries in Brazil and pre-salt, and there, the actual porosity and permeability has been enhanced by acidic fluids coming out of the source rock and coming up to the base of the salt and actually can't get through any further than that and actually have dissolved uh, the limestone there and increased the porosity and permeability. And these, these rocks are absolutely fantastic. These rocks will flow at 25,000 barrels per well per day. These are really, really good. So diagenesis can be your friend at times. Seal and trap types, I mean, seal is fairly straightforward. You need a shale, a salt. Salt is particularly good because it flows as well as um, rather than is more uh, brittle and can, and can fracture. Um, but what you also have to do too is have a trap. So this is the oldest picture in the world of different traps, which, which still works. It actually has um, most of the traps we, we think about in many ways. So you can have your standard anticline, which is conformed by a compressional regime um, with a seal above it. You could have a stratigraphic pinch out, which is really just to have a reservoir in the blue, and as it goes further to the to the your right, um, the facies change, and that gives you a pinch out and a trap, an unconformity trap in similar ways. Most of the North Sea fields are tilted fault blocks like this because you're in a rift basin where you've had a lot of faulting like that, <coughs> stepping down into the basin. And it could easily be something like a salt dome, which is much more Gulf of Mexico-like in terms of, again, creating a compressional regime to give yourself a trap. So traps are all good stuff, but the question was, was the trap there when your oil migrated? Um, so if they weren't, then actually you've just sort of kind of missed the bus. So knowing, knowing when, when you know, actually measuring your, your entire thermal history, knowing when your oil migrated, was your reservoir there? Was your trap there? Was your seal there? Was your trap there? And actually, after all that, if you trapped oil, did something else happen such that the trap broke, if you like, or leaked or whatever? And there are plenty of examples of exhumed oil fields around the world with, with oil at surface. For example, the Canadian tar sands is basically a failed trap and it all came to surface. So, I mean, we drilled in the right place. We're simply 30 million years too late. I mean, you know, a trap may have actually existed, and, and, but 30 million years ago, it, it breached. Uh, whoever Richard Bray was. <coughs> so again, we think about this in trap presence. Can I see a trap on my seismic? And trap effectiveness, how long will it last and how good a trap is it? So if it's not very effective, this will go in your risk equation to actually sort of downgrade your chance of success. So now I know what I want. How do I look for it? So... There's a basin far away and a country far away. Where would I start? What would I do? Now, you might say the whole world's been explored, and the whole world has been explored to some degree, degree or other, but often different parts of the world were explored with, you know, 20-year-old seismic, and you knew much better than that these days. They may be in deeper water than we could explore for 20 years ago. So come, sort of basins come and go in, in the sort of life of things. So what would I want to know? Or well, maybe, for example, the government said, actually, the t my fiscal terms are much better than they used to be because I need some new investment. So, okay, fine. It's suddenly attractive when it wasn't attractive before. Because all the way through this, this has got to be economic, otherwise it doesn't work. So, for, you know, what do we do first? Firstly, get all the data you can get. And this could be rubbish old 2D. This can be, you know, bad quality logs, but they're all you've got to work on. So you have to get all the data, and there's been... You know, there's been stories of data in the wrong place and countries bringing people in with, with data that wasn't really there and various sort of stories. You need to get all the data and you've got to verify how good it is and, and what faith you can put in it. The next thing is, well, actually, what was the plate tectonic setting? What was the basin type? Were we in a rift basin? What are we in? Are we in a compressional phase? What was there when your, when your first ingredients were being laid down? Can I see a source rock? Do I have some old wells with oil and gas shows in there? 
If I do, that's good, that's encouraging. If I have a basin full of completely dry holes, does that mean it's no good? Or do, they, do they just drill those in the wrong place? No. So basin type and dimensions, you know, what, are the ma what are the map tectonic elements? What are the major tectonic events? Because throughout this whole thing, you're trying to build a story over you know, 100 million years, 200 million years, living the life of that basin um, such that you understand where that hydrocarbon went to, what's the chance of it being trapped, and what's the chance of you being able to get hold of it. So the magnitude and rates of subsidence and sedimentation, what's the accommodation space? What was the hinterland? You know, was it nice granite, it'll erode nicely, so I'll have, I'll have some felspars, but I'll have a lot of quartz. So quartz is a nice stable reservoir uh, constituent. Or is it, is it metamorphic? Has it got a lot of micas in there which will degrade and not make a very good reservoir? Well, it might do, in which case I'd rather not be there. I'd rather be somewhere else because I've got to think about all these things as I can. Was there uplift in erosion? Well, when did that happen? You know, did I actually, was it after my oil migrated and I've lost it, or is that okay? And what was the temperature? What was the heat flow history? You don't turn your basin on to you know, 180 degrees and go and sit down. It's done a variety of things through time. It may have gone down, it may have come up. It may have frozen the generation until it was then buried deeply, more deeply again afterwards. You've got to build that story to understand where your, your hydrocarbons might, might be. So it's surface temperature, seabed temperature, so this is all, God, I'm, I'm talking about a slide here that I'm seeing here and you are, you're not seeing up there. This is this wonderful slide I was just talking about. Um, this is the problem about doing two presentations in a day. So, um, what data do you have? All these black lines here are seismic lines. Um, this is a map offshore somewhere. I can't think quite where it is at the moment. So there is a database here which is quite dense. So can you get all that data um, if you can? How much will it cost you? Do you want to spend that money on that particular acreage to get all that data? Do you want to get a reconnaissance grid? Do you want, you want to say, well, give me an idea, and I'll decide whether to buy some more. So here's my basin setting. Um, what are the mega sequences I've got? You know, where are my potential source rocks, reservoirs, and seals? Analogs. Analogs are fantastic at convincing your exploration manager to go and drill something. You know, you sort of say, you've seen something like this before. It's in this fantastic, prolific province that you'll love, you know, and it's just like that, you know. And analogs are very, very useful things because they help you say, well, okay, I can understand what happened there, and I can use that history to help me here when I haven't got anything at all yet, potentially. So this is one of our diagrams which we had, and it's nothing earth-shattering. It's just all the things you need to think about on, on one diagram. So which plays do we want to evaluate? Oops, sorry. Um, which plays do we want to evaluate? Because you might want to have a Jurassic source with a Miocene reservoir or a Cretaceous reservoir, whatever reservoir it is, which things juxtapose against which? Most basins have got more than one play, and you might sort of be in a shallow one, a deep one. Are you looking for gas? Are you looking for oil? Um, and are you going deeper than the previous plays? So, and here is your structural and thermal history here. Now, with this, you might say, well, good. I kind of like this basin. I think it might work. I think it's got some hydrocarbons being generated here that people haven't found so far. Which end of the basin do I want to be in? Which country do I want to be in? Because this basin may stretch across three countries. And the fiscal terms of those change from country to country. Well, actually, which ones are the best ones for the company rather than the government? So you get a better share of, of the pie because you're taking most of the risk. Which of the countries are more stable than the other ones? Well, balance that into your uncertainty too. So you're trying to focus in then, and then you're into your prospect generation. So roughly, or you're thinking about where your prospects might be, because you might then have to go and shoot seismic. You're saying, I can see something that I want to go and bid and get a license for. So what's the prospect? The prospect is a recognized but not yet drilled trap, which is believed to be potentially hydrocarbon bearing. Uh, it's all in the eye of the beholder, um, usually at this, this stage. So. What plays may work? What's my best chance of actually finding that prospect? There's lots of acronyms on here, but think things like the GDE, the gross depositional environment, at different parts of this basin at different levels. So where, we, when was, where was my source rock richest? It may be existing everywhere. You'd be very, very lucky, or actually it may be great here and not so good here. It may be buried more deeply here and be gas prone when there's no gas market, so that's no good and you want to be over here. So your, your original gross depositional environment is very important for your reservoir, for your source, uh, for your seal. And actually, do they overlay? Or have I got reservoir over there, source over there, and seal over there, in which case I'm nowhere. I've got to have these things in the right ju juxtaposition to make this thing work. And we come back to petroleum systems modeling. 
When was the reservoir formed? When was the seal formed? When did maturation happen? If they aren't done in the right order, you just, just, just miss the boat again. And common risk segment, I mean, it's really just thinking about the existence and the risking of all those things in different parts, parts of the basin. But the bit that I think is particularly important, which we tend to, it's quite easy to sort of um, miss or not, not do enough of, is well failure analysis. Why did everybody else not succeed? Are you that much smarter? Or actually, do you have much better data? In which case you might say, they couldn't see a trap. They thought this was a prospect. It wasn't, because now we can see with this better data that actually it leaks, and that's why they didn't succeed. But often, if you're not careful, you can think you're smarter, and you're no smarter at all, really. So the question really is, make sure you understand. I always ask the question, who explored this before, and why did they stop, and why did they go away? And if it's 20 years ago, you might say, well, the data they had really wasn't good enough. But if it's three years ago, and the company's quite a smart company, to say, well, you know, come on, guys, are you sure we're that much smarter than those guys? To actually sort of follow them up and bid three wells and $100 million <coughs> worth of work? You know, you need to convince me that we have something that they don't have. So we get to our equation. So we've got to multiply some things through to get risk. Okay, risk, in my mind, is does the prospect work? Okay. Uncertainty is what's the range of resources it might have in it and where are we on that uncertainty curve? Because we'll have made a prospect up, we'll have a rough idea of what it is perhaps, and you say it might be 100 million barrels P50, and it might be 200 million barrels P10, and 35 at sort of P90 or something like that. So it's going to have a range because you're going to put in different reservoir thicknesses, you're going to put into your, into your uh, calculation of volumes different porosities, different reservoir thicknesses, different hydrocarbon saturations, different variety of things. You'll have a range of how big that prospect might be. Is it full to spill? Is it only half full? All those things. So how, how big might that prospect be? That's uncertainty. But the real question is, if it doesn't work, then all the rest is just guff. It's just, you know, uncertainty is simple. I mean, there, there's nothing there. So we're multiplying through to get a chance of success. Reservoir presence times reservoir effectiveness, times source presence, times source effectiveness, times trap presence, times trap effectiveness. So six multiples, okay? And each of these is between, say, naught and one. So you might say, in, say in source, if you were drilling in the North Sea next to a proven field, you say, I'm pretty sure there's a source because it just created 100 million barrels over there and I'm sort of next door. And you say, okay, fine, more. maybe stick one in for that or 0.8. Uh, effectiveness, well, actually, is the source here, and all the oil went that way, and your prospect's over here. Well, I'm not sure you're going get to get one for effectiveness from me on that one. Now, if you put in somewhere between, if you put in, say, 75%, I'm feeling pretty good about most of these things. Put in 75% six times, and you multiply this through, you get a chance of success of 18%. So, four out of five of these things won't work, okay? even though you're 75% sure of all the ingredients. And that really kind of makes you think, because you're going to compare this against Joe's prospect, Mary's prospect, because actually in your company, you'll be looking at 10 basins, and you'll have, you know, 100 geologists or whatever, all working these things, and you're saying, I've only got enough money to drill 10 of these things, and I've got a prospect list of 200 or whatever it might be, or 100 which are ready or something, 50 which are ready probably. So you're competing with somebody else, and the question is, you know, is your prospect better than the other person's, and how do I make it better? So how do I, how do I improve my chance of success? Now, you might say, if I shoot some more seismic, I can define that reservoir trap better. Good. Can I define the reservoir presence? Sorry, the actual trap better. Can I define the reservoir presence? Um, better seismic might help me with that. But will it tell me oh, the, the reservoir effectiveness? Well, no, I need a well. So there may be some things after a while you can't get any better than what you've got, and eventually you're going to have to go and drill something. But overall, you're going to use this and combine it with how big is the structure. Now, if I've got an 80% chance of success of 10 million barrels, I'm not very interested because actually it's not very big and it's quite a high risk. If I've got an 80% chance of a billion barrels, I'm much more interested. I'll take that chance, you know. So, for example, when we've drilled the, first, the second um, well in the pre-salt in Brazil, the Tupi Prospect, which is now the Lula Field, had a chance of success of 
And that's about the best we could do with it. We had 3D size, we had all sorts of stuff, but actually we had no source rock pure presence. You know, actually, we had no well through it, so you could only say maybe 75%. The reservoir, gosh, we really didn't know. So again, it was like a 75%. You know, we had a big structure, so that was quite good. But at a billion, actually, it's bigger than a billion barrels. It's about four billion barrels. You know, so that 17%, I'll drill it. So we drilled it. It came in. You know, it came in. It's good. So it's size, value versus risk. So to move on, so I like an area. I, you know, how do I get some acreage? You know, I think people don't, I don't understand quite often how do you do it. It's very straightforward. Um, in general, you know, licenses are obtained through licensing rounds or direct negotiation with government. And usually it's highest bid wins. So how sure are you of the potential of that acreage? Do you love it to bits? Or do you think, actually, it's not bad, but I'm not sure, really. How good are the fiscal terms in that country? So, so the bid system, usually, you know, you'll, you invariably drill, or you'll invariably bid with other companies. We do most things in joint ventures to spread risk. Uh, because you wouldn't want to be drilling lots of 100% things, really. So what does the government want? The government wants a competent, reliable operator who's good at finding oil and gas because they'd like to find oil and gas because that pays taxes and creates national wealth and all such things. Um, and you may have people who specialise in certain areas better than other areas and whatever. So reputation, competency, very important, technology capabilities and such things. But generally, highest bid wins. I think it's great. I offer three wells, which are going to cost me $80 million each and some seismic and some other bits and pieces. I've just bid $400 million, $300 million worth of work. And if the next bid is you know, less than that, generally I will win and I've got this license. How long have I got it for? I may have it for three years plus another three years afterwards. Probably after three years or maybe it's five years, it just depends. I'm going to relinquish half the acreage or a third of the acreage. So as soon as you start relinquishing it, you've got to make sure that you haven't left something behind that the next guy is going to pick up after you. Because that's really embarrassing. You know? So not that I've ever done it, of course. You know, but um, I haven't done it too many times. Because really you get to this point saying, you know, I don't love it to bits, but God, it's, you know, it's 200 million barrels, and it's got a chance of success or something. Do I want to drill it, or do I want to leave it behind? You know, so, um, so your exploration license may last three to 10 years. If you have a success, you can t convert it to a production license, but your terms are negotiated up front when you don't know what you have at all. So you've got fiscal terms, and generally, higher technical risk means better fiscal terms for the oil company, okay? Because the government can ask, um, for, for better fiscal terms for them when the, when the risk is lower. So where do you want to go to explore? So here's a sort of a bit of a generalization. This is a Woodmax slide, and this is government take for new license awards in different countries. So Algeria, 91% government take. Do I want to go and explore there? No, I don't want to go and explore there. <laughs> I'm not going to live with the 9% and take all the risk, because you're paying all the money up front in terms of your exploration program. The government's paying nothing, okay? So, don't want to be there. Venezuela in 89, not really either, for a variety of reasons. But as you work down, you may say, well, actually, Bulgaria is fantastic. You know, I get 81%, but no one's found any oil in Bulgaria for quite some time. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing, you see. Ireland, where is Ireland these days? You know, 38%, that's not bad. Ireland is usually sort of down the bottom there. It always tells a good story, but no one's found anything for quite a while. But there's always this air of romance in Ireland. So. <laughs> UK is good, 38%. It's quite a good place to go and explore to make money. But it's very, very mature, so what's the chance of you finding anything very big? <coughs> um, increasingly difficult as time goes on. Now, this diagram would change continually. And all it takes is often the industry and government get out of kilter with each other. And they sort of say the government thinks their acreage is too good, or occasionally the industry thinks acreage is too good too, and all it takes is two or three dry wells. Everybody goes, oh, God, that's not very good either. Or a license round when no one comes to play, and the government says, oh, God, I've put the terms too high, and then they sort of resort them. So this is a continually interactive business, and you're competing on a global basis. So all companies will say, that's too expensive for the prospectivity they see. I'll go and explore over there, because you can. Right, so let's quickly canter through, once having got a, a license, what do you do? Well, the first thing you're going to be doing is exploration program, and with all these things, you're trying to de-risk the acreage as efficiently and cheaply as possible. So what would I be doing first? Gravity and magnetics, field work, then 2D seismic, that's all quite cheap. 3D seismic, more expensive. Drilling, big bucks, generally. So you'd be doing the cheaper stuff first. Because most acreage you'll look at and you'll say, actually, I don't think it's worth drilling wells on. 
prospects aren't big enough, the risk is too high, I'll go and do it somewhere else. You're trying to high grade your acreage continually as you, as you go through it. Seismic, I mean, you know, seismic is very simple in, in principle. Uh, up there, you, you send a, a wave down, it bounces back up, and you get an idea of what the structure is. It is hugely more complicated than that. Um, marine seismic is fairly straightforward. You can sail up and down and acquire huge swathes of it. If you're shooting seismic here, which we were doing in Bolivia, life is much more complicated. Um, but actually, we managed to get some good seismic through here, <coughs> relatively good, um, as time went along. So seismic has just got so much better in over, over recent years. And I think really we've had this sort of surge of 20 years of much better seismic. A few new provinces coming, in, coming onto the world market, if you like, like Brazil, certain parts of the FSU, some parts of Africa. So we had some very good exploration results. And we kind of run, run out of that, that of steam of those things. There's no new provinces, really. Uh, Mexico, maybe, um, but not really many more than that. And we haven't had a leap forward in technology either. So seismic really just allows you to see better. That's all it comes down to. And therefore, you can see and reduce your risk because you can see your trap. You can see whether it leaks, perhaps. You might have even have direct hydrocarbon identification on your seismic. In some cases, not, not all cases at all. Sometimes it's still rubbish. Uh, this, this is the Bolivian stuff here. But actually, when you back calculate it, what it should be by doing sort of integrated <coughs> geological model and your know, structural model and this, you can come up with an idea of what it might look like. And actually, uh, we're probably about five wells into all this now, and actually the, the model is, really, is actually very good. Um, so we've had a high, high success rate. So drilling, this is where the big bucks start. So a land rig, if you're on, onshore in the States, a shale gas well these days will call you, cost you $5 million or something, or $4 million, or whatever they're doing them for these days, to drill and complete a well. Uh, hugely efficient machine with lots of rigs and lots of competition and lots of wells being drilled and lots of learning. So that's all good. Um, we were drilling wells in Australia onshore, and we had to, we had to, to bring a, a rig in from America to go and drill the wells, because there wasn't any, there weren't any rigs in Australia the right size. And then you just drilling one well and two wells and three wells, you never get this sort of experience and this learning. So it was always, always much more difficult. So shallow water, uh, southern North Sea stuff, jack-up rig. Yeah, what's a well going to cost you? 25, 35 million dollars, something of that sort. Relatively cheap. If you're into this stuff here, this is a rig we used in Tanzania for a while, the deep sea Stavanger. This was probably half a million dollars a day um, to use, plus another half a million dollars a day in terms of helicopters, support, all the rest of the stuff on board. So you're into a million dollars a day program. Um, it's getting quite pricey, so you want to be quite sure about your chance of success before you uh, start doing these things. This rig here, deep sea Metro, was what we ended up using in our second phase in Tanzania where we drilled 16 successful wells on the trot. So actually, we had good seismic. We had a good drilling machine. We actually did very, very well. Um, can drill you know, in 12,000 meters plus and all this sort of stuff. It's, uh, these are fantastic machines. But this was costing us $650,000 a day then. Now, with a lower oil price, it's probably being rented out for $300,000 a day. So it's, it's costs have been squeezed down quite, um, quite reasonably. Um, success rates. Um, so this is success rates for exploration wells. So I had a you know, good purple patch through here, 40% doing really well here. Uh, a lot of wells being drilled and actually just declining overall success rate in recent times. So around about just above 20% here. And volume size, again, you know, finding some big things back in the sort of early or the mid-noughties, if you like. Some big discoveries in Brazil, um, Brazil, East Africa. I mean, uh, things in Tanzania and Mozambique, huge resources in Mozambique found. But actually, um, again, much smaller now. And this is an issue we, we need to sort of um, think what's going to be the next thing that changes things. <coughs> so you have a discovery. This is great. We're all happy. What do we do now? Um, really, you're into uncertainty. How big do you really think this is before you go and make your decision to develop? Because so far, we've spent... Um, we spent about, to tell you on an exploration program, you might have spent two or three hundred million dollars, which in, in, in our game is, is not very much. But the next thing is you're going to spend maybe four or five billion dollars, and that's a lot of money. And you're actually deciding to be there for 20 years or 30 years or whatever. So, um, you know, where, where are you going to appraise it? How many appraisal wells can you afford to drill? 
So, you know, you may say, I've, I've drilled it in the middle of the prospect, I'll have a well here and I'll have a well here, and we should make sure it's there, the, the oil water contact's the same. And you say, okay, good, that's fine. But how about the other side of that fault? I mean, is the oil water contact going to be different? You know, or gas water contact, higher, lower? What about over here where the reservoir gets worse, if we think from our FASIS modelling? Oh, I better put a well there, okay. So how many wells are you going to test to make sure that actually we, it does flow like we think it's going to flow? Because that takes quite some time as well. So if you're testing some of these wells at a million dollars a day, how long is your test program going to be? Uh, it's always an interesting discussion with the engineers. Um, and eventually, how, many, how much can you afford to spend on appraisal before you say, actually, I think I'm there. My range of reserves is big enough that I think my P50, I'm, I'm happy I'm going to get to my P50, and my P50 is economic at my price scenarios. Um, again, the decision you're going to take without enough, with, with less information than you wish you had. So if I'm onshore in the States, and this is why shale oil and shale gas wells are so attractive, individually, <coughs> nothing to it, $5 million. Tie it into a pipeline, make money, or make, make some money. You know? So in terms of the shale oil revolution in the States, which is changing the exploration picture, because it is now the sort of marginal, you know, lowest marginal cost oil supply, you can actually, there's 10,000 mum and pop operations who can all do this whenever they want to do it. It's not owned by a single government like Saudi Arabia. If you're into wells in um, the Southern North Sea, you're into projects, you know, you may be spending $500 million, depending on what, you, what you're doing there. Gulf of Mexico, you could be spending two to, two to seven billion on deep water, uh, very deep, very long wells. And if you're here in, in, in Brazil, I mean, Santos Basin, sort of capital costs of a, a variety of fields which are all very large and doing very well, possibly $29 billion you can spend there. You know, so quite large costs, and you're doing these in, in, in individual parts. But you're in, to you, there are different sort of segments for different sized purses in many ways. And what's the sort of break-even cost? And I think this is probably out of date. You know, unconventional projects used to be 60, it's probably now $45 or something like that in the Eaglesford or even $40. Uh, other parts outside the sweet spot, it may still be 60. Um, shallow water projects, possibly in the order of 70, but generally they're not very big things. So actually the, the real thing is, what's the proximity to, to infrastructures to tie back to? That's really your, um, your the, the crux of it. How long a pipeline, what tariff do I pay? How, big, how much uncertainty have I got on those reserves? And big ones, I mean, I personally think that deep water and ultra-deep water, I mean, we have this figure of 50. Um, it's got to be a world-class reservoir. If it's not a world-class reservoir, it won't compete at these sorts of oil prices anymore. It's just got to be the best. So you see a Brazil, which is the best, fantastic. You see some of these Mozambique gas wells are fantastic, and they'll work, but lots of things which are not quite good enough probably will, will sit on the, on the shelf for a long time. Oil price, other minor um, variation when you're making your next decision. So this is the oil price from, what, January 13 at 110 down to lower 30-ish. And this is a, a graph from last year, and I'm, I'm impressed with that we're actually still within the range of what they were thinking about. It's always good, because um, quite often we're not. So today we're 55 or 54, whatever it is. So when you're thinking about you know, investing your $5 billion in your project, well, what may, may, what may drive, drive it lower? You know, well, slower economic growth, faster penetra you know, penetration of electric vehicles so we don't use so much. You know, what are the ones which may make it higher? Well, things going wrong you know, with fields or mature fields declining further. So there are drivers in both ways. So what makes you feel happy in terms of your range of um, scenarios you're, you're putting in you know, as we say here, energy forecasting is easy. It's getting it right that's difficult. In a sense. And the other thing, of course, is where are we thinking about doing all this? What kind of country is it? Um, so we might think, you know, we're in the North Sea. It's fine. Uh, political stability? Well, not too bad. Um, fiscal stability? Not at all. I mean, we've had more changes in taxation in the UK on our fields over the last 40 years and any other country around the world ever, I think. It just changes. The government wants some more money this year. It'll change, it'll tweak it up, it'll tweak it down. It's how life is and you kind of get used to it. Um, so it's not those countries far away that do this. It's, it's, um, it's the ones closer to home. 
So political stability, how long is the government that you just took out your license with going to be around for, and what's the alternative if they go away and somebody else comes in? Are they going to actually honour the contracts? So things to think about. Um, <clears throat> access to energy markets, competing fuels. I mean, where are we going to be? You know, you've got gas versus, you know, pipe gas versus LNG, conventional versus unconventional, you have renewables. So actually, what is the picture in 25 years' time? Because I need to know that now when I'm making this decision. And I don't know that now, so I've got to put this into my uncertainty. Environmental sensitivity. Oil and gas companies obey all laws and all regulations. They do. They don't, people don't want to go to jail. Okay? So they do, but what, what, what will those regulations change to in 10 years' time or 20 years' time? I don't know. You know? But they, there's a fair chance they will change. Licence to operate. You know, you've got to, you're doing something amongst the community if you're onshore. How do you get along with that community? I mean, you've got to think about, am I doing things which, which they are happy with that actually means I have good relations for the next 20 years? And this is a picture of us um, negotiating with communities in, down in Bolivia, which actually went, went very well. And climate change, what are the rules going to be in 10 years' time, 20 years' time? You know, is gas a safer option to go to because it's part of the future and oil less so? Yes, potentially, but um, what do we think? And the answer is we don't know, but we'll, we'll find out when we get there. So, back to the original question. Good or bad value for money? So here we have some comparisons. So we have oil, $47 a barrel, a snip. Uh, milk, $198 a barrel. Okay, put that on your cereal. Um, <laughs> water. Bottled water, $269 a barrel. Coke, $480 a barrel. Okay. You have a coffee this afternoon? $806 a barrel. Okay. I hope you enjoyed it. And that wine, glass of wine later, $3,000 a barrel. So, well, actually, if anybody's here is wearing Chanel number no. five, go home and give your husband a big, big hug later, okay? Because he thinks of the world of you because he just paid a million dollars a barrel for that stuff. Okay. So. So overall, it's just interesting to see, and our, our, generally our view of the, the price of oil, and you, and you actually gave me, you, you, you were uh, remarkably good about this, normally, you're better than the, the earlier session, um, <laughs> but normally we think about oil as in petrol, whereas the petrol price, I mean, two-thirds of that is just, it's just taxation, it's got nothing, nothing to do with oil at all. So, so I hope I've been able to demonstrate that we have risk and we have uncertainty in the oil and gas business, and actually the business has got to manage in a very sophisticated way both of these two things. Expiration, um, you know, 25% chance of success or even less. Um, it's, you know, it's a tough place to start from. Um, a company's expiration program will consist of high, medium and low risk. It, it, it'll have a mixture. It'll be in numerous ventures at different equities. It needs to to balance that risk. Otherwise, what will happen is if all you drilled was drilled for great big elephants all the time, you would go bust fairly quickly because the chance of success of those is not enough. You want those in your portfolio, but not too many. So over a 20-year period, you know, we need to be balancing technical risk and uncertainty in the subsurface, project management risk in terms of actually building a thing, and above ground risk including politics, markets, oil price forecasts, environmental, climate, and license to operate. So a pretty wide sphere of things. To me, it looks a lot more difficult than coffee. Okay. So, with that, I rest my case. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Questions from the floor. Over, over there. I'll leave you the handle. <laughs> oh, thank you for, for a very interesting talk. Um, that list of uh, licenses for different countries, how much uh, they're charging, you probably quite rightly dismissed Bulgaria, but the second cheapest one was Romania. Now, that's a proven oil field, and it's in the EU. Kazakhstan, 67%. How does that mitigate against the cost of extracting oil? Uh, presumably, they're not exhausted fields. Yeah, I think, that, as I said, the devil's in the detail in a way, because that's, that's the, what Woodmac have in that slide is, is the government take for new license rounds. So it's acreage which is available for you to go and get now, whereas you might say in Kazakhstan, actually almost, in my view, 
you know, almost all the oil is in licenses and being produced by existing licenses. So actually, the, the, the license terms for open acreage in Kazakhstan, I think it's quite tough to find oil in open acreage in Kazakhstan, which doesn't mean to say that Kazakhstan hasn't got a fantastic oil industry. It's just that most of it's been found and is held. So with Romania, again, are you going to find two million barrels? Are you going to, get, are you going to find five? Are you going to get, find 100? It's size. It's all those things that you're trying to sort of balance these things. These are just factual things, so it's... Um, I'm just thinking that uh, the Nazis relied almost entirely on Romanian oil. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it's, a, it's been a great hydrocarbon province for a long time, but it's probably pretty mature now. So they need to get more money, more people in, so therefore, therefore they offer a very low government take. Now, if, if, if five companies all jumped in and picked up all the spare acreage, then that government take would, would then increase for the next licence round because mm. they could. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, one down the front. Oh, very interesting. And two questions, please. What technology are you looking for in the future to reduce the risks, particularly of the uh, discovery exploration phase? And the second one is, given the complexity and the variety of these risks, how do you actually assess them and play them off against one another to get some numerical answer in the end? Is this a kind of Bayesian thing? Uh, <clears throat> yes, to a degree. Um, but in, I mean, in terms of the discovery phase, we're always looking for the next bit of good seismic. But the question is, what, what, what is the next thing? I feel like we're sort of not exhausted, but we've sort of come to an end of a sort of a, an improvement phase. So what is the next thing? I don't know. Um, and, and the trouble, of course, is that most of the seismic companies are in dire straits because actually, because the price of oil fell, everybody stopped doing exploration and buying data. And the seismic companies have got these huge array of fleets of boats which they, that they've you know, built in, in the good years and are now going bust because there's, there's no work. So, so, so how can we expect them to suddenly come up with the next solution? It's, it's a bit of an ask in many ways. In terms of your, what are you going to do with the, for these projects, I mean, I've talked about chance of success which you'll work through versus your risk reserves, okay? So in theory, over a decent portfolio, you should find your risk reserves. Otherwise, you, if you're estimating... Um, if you're finding less, you're either overestimating your chance of success or you're overestimating your volumes in your traps. So really, you should be checking this every now and then saying, actually, am I doing it? You won't do it every year because you'll just get a certain sequence of wells. You need about five years to do it. But overall, the industry, I think at the moment, is not finding its risk reserves. That's what I understand from talking to various people. In terms of your project thing, well then... How many, how many high-risk countries can you afford to be in as a company of a certain type and size? So, for example, I mean, when BG was involved in the Kashigan discovery back in about 2000, which is the biggest discovery for, you know, 30 years, it was about 10 billion barrels, we actually sold out of it after discovery because we were also involved in Kazakhstan in the Karachaganak field, which is huge too. So t there was too many eggs in one basket. So we said, for us, we can have 20% of our business in Kazakhstan. We can't have 40% of our business. So for us, we had to sort of diversify. If you're an Exxon Mobil or someone like that, you can do differing things. Um, another question is, how much unconventional versus conventional do you want to have? It's portfolios. It's, um, and what are you good at? Are you good at deep water gas? Are you good at deep water something? Are you good at high pressure, high temperature? Most people aren't good at everything. So... It's a mishmash of all those things, rather than a numerical answer. Uh, one at the back, please. Thank you. Um, your graph of uh, average size of field found over the past, uh, I don't know how many years it went back, but obviously um, we don't know what, what's coming. But how much... Uh, how much uh, influence will oil price have on that? So it only went to 2014, and obviously the, the average size <coughs> dropped off. But the oil price was quite high, probably lots of exploration, presumably. So through to 2016, when, or 2017 now, when there's not much exploration, you're only going to go for large fields because the economics work. So how much... How much influence do you think uh, price has on that graph? That, that's basically my question. Okay. Um, well, normally what would happen is the oil price goes down, people stop exploring, and, and then there's a, there, there, be, there starts to become a shortage of projects coming through. 
because you know you have you haven't explored, you haven't found things, and then then the oil price will tend to sort of drift up a bit, and then people will have more confidence to go out and drill wells, and we have this sort of you know, cycle. The thing that's changed that, I think at the moment, is, is the creation of, of shale oil in the States, or shale gas in the States. So the unconventional drilling of, of wells in the States has created a different kind of input to those sums. So as soon as the price of oil falls down below a certain, goes, goes up above a certain point, then shale oil wells will be drilled because in different basins they'll be economic at $45, $50, $60, and that production will come on very, very quickly. And then that'll, that'll sort of turn the price down a bit, probably. You know, it won't carry on going up because it's been satiated by some more oil coming onto the market. So life has changed because of that. Because in the old days, that used to be Saudi Arabia, when you know, at times could turn things down or turn things up and did it to balance OPEC and all those things. So I think the world's changed in that regard. The other thing that's changed is gas prices uh, from the states again, because you have a, a, an almost indefinite supply of um, fairly cheap gas that can come out of the states from shale gas. So if I'm looking for LNG projects, for example. So in the old days, BG was big into LNG, and obviously still is. So I would go out and try and find big gas for us to make an LNG project out of and that would be part of our business. So we've got LNG projects in Trinidad, in, um, in Egypt. So the more recent one we went out to do was in, in East Africa, so we found a lot of gas in Tanzania. The trouble is, how economic is that in terms of being in deeper water? Um, perfectly good reservoirs. You know, we found between ourselves and Statoil next door, we probably found 30 TCF. I mean, it's a lot of gas in the old days. But actually, you're competing with gas coming out of the Gulf Coast as LNG, at $4.50, Henry Hub price, or $3, or whatever it is. And that's changed the whole gas equation internationally, too, because it's very hard to compete with LNG. Now, you know, OK, we'd have LNG on the east coast of Africa taking it to China to a short, short trip, say, or taking it to India. But and you've got to take it from the Gulf, Gulf Coast. But the Gulf Coast, I mean, you're just building, you know, LNG plants on... In, in, on American turf, so none of those, not many of those country risks have gone away, you know, and you're just shipping an extra 2,000 miles or whatever. So it's, I, I think the LNG market is going to be quite different going forward um, just because the game's changed a bit as well. So, um, so we, won't have, you know, we won't have the typical supply, supply demand thing won't be quite as obvious and clear as before because they are because of unconventional resources, both oil and gas. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> uh, one down here. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. Um, all the people that do these exploration projects around the world, exciting stuff, running the seismic vessels, going out looking, looking at the source rocks, Given the uh, very low level of investment at the moment and the, uh, the very unique skills that are required in this field of geology um, and the number of young people and mid-career professionals both uh, coming into the profession and ultimately the other end of the resource pool leaving and retiring from the profession, uh, are we at risk of not having enough geologists to do exactly this kind of work in, say, a few years' time when things pick up again? Um. In the long term, yes, because I think we aren't, I think recruitment of geologists into universities has declined, and, and it's not unreasonable because you know, most people will just say, well, what's the chance of a, a job? And they'll talk to their friends and their cousins and the people who are older than them and just say, actually, how many of you have got jobs coming out of this and actually it doesn't look very good, I'll go and do something else. Um, I mean, that happens often, and a certain number of people will still go into it because they, they love it and they want to. Um, we used to talk about a thing called the Great Crew Change, um, probably 10 years ago, which was really a lot of people like me um, who went into the business, you know, in the in the 70s, if you like, and you know, guess what? We're all 40 years older, so you're going to get to retirement time of around 65, and people say, actually, that's fine. I'm I'm off now. And have we got all those? Have we got people to replace all those people? People were predicting this 10 years ago, and it hasn't really quite happened somehow or other because. I think we've, we've, we've become more efficient. So the, so the computers and the software allow you to do more things with less people. Um, 
people are working longer. A lot of people don't retire and just carry on doing it because they enjoy doing it. So we haven't quite had that crash you might have thought should be coming. But sometime or other it's got to be, um, got to be coming. But at the moment it's not particularly obvious. At the moment there, there are a lot of people who are unemployed um, and the consolidation in the industry. So um, there's quite a lot of take up of people who are unemployed first without getting too short. So long term I agree with you, there'll be a sort of a, there, there, there will be a, a gap. But it's been, it's probably, it was probably overestimated 10 years ago and it hasn't quite happened yet. <laughs> right, any more for any more? Last question. And another glass of wine. I'm just going back uh, an answer you gave before about the exploration future. Um, what, what, what's the landscape that you can see out there given that exploration over the last 10, 15 years has kind of dwindled? Um, who are going to be the explorers in your mind and what role does exploration have for um, oil and gas companies? Uh, it's funny because if, if you sort of look back over time, I can remember probably five years ago thinking having... Having so no, well, yeah, about five or seven years ago, having so much find, fun finding so much oil and gas that it was entirely different to 20 years earlier. And you think, well, actually, because I can remember back in the 80s thinking, God, we're going to find anything around it. It's so hard to find something that's economic. You know, you're thinking, you know, are we, at the, are we in the end game here? And then what it takes is some, you know, some new provinces opening up, some better sized mix, some deeper drilling rigs and all this sort of stuff, then you've got a new area. You know, you've got some new things to sort of go and look at. And that's what we've really enjoyed for the last 10 years. Going forward, um, life will be different because, I mean, what we've also lost in between time, we've lost all the medium-sized companies. So if you look at the time between 2005 and 2010, 12, it was the, it was the mid-sized independents who made most of the discoveries. And my rationale for that was in 2000 to 2002, 2003, the big companies all merged with each other. So BP took over Arco and Amico, Exxon took over Mobil, Fina, uh, Total took over Fina and whatever it was, and Elf. And they all then sort of spent two or three years bringing all their portfolios together, risking them, sorting themselves out, all the rest of it, and drilling the best stuff, but didn't go out and get any new acreage. And the people who went out and got new acreage were mostly independents. So BG was one, Anadarko was another, there were a few others who went out and, and you know, the Tullos of this world did really well because they, they rode the wave of new technology in new areas for a while. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I find it, I kind of find it difficult to say where would I go next, really? But I've often found that and life changes. There's always, there, there's always a new story, there's a new version, there, there is something else we haven't thought of yet. I think, new co I think small companies will become important because all the, the medium-sized independents are all gone. You know, BG was taken over. There's Shell and BP up here at 200 million, and the next lot down here are Tullow, Cairn, and Ophir at sort of three and a half or something. So there's a big void in between. So I think there is room for, for probably a grassroots-led exploration sort of thing to sort of research, you know, to, to come back again. And that's just our the, the life cycle of our business, I think. I think the big companies will probably be relatively risk averse and have part of their portfolio in, in unconventionals and they'll be doing a bit of exploration but not very much. But it's amazing how there's always money around to be spent on these things, particularly when you can't make a decent return in lots of other investments. People will come and invest in exploration companies again. So I see a bit of a, I'll see a resurgence in the next two or three years. It's going to take a little while of $55 plus. But, um, but actually, we, we, we are remarkable as an industry of actually sort of going through um, periods of renewal and resurgence. Actually, when you're when you can't, not quite sure where it's going to happen next, then suddenly it does. So, go on, one last question. As you next door. Yes, it would follow up on this. Uh, uh, this talk was about the next tens of years, 50 years, maybe, maybe even more. Do you have a private opinion when the oil and then gas will run out. Oh, I mean, when, when, when will oil and gas run out? It depends on the economics. What's the price of a barrel of oil? At, at, a, at $150, it will last much longer than at $50 because it's worth exploring it for $150. But at $50, it's not worth exploring it. Gas, there is a huge amount of gas. I mean, really. And, and with, with, with unconventional gas, too. I mean, the world won't run out of gas in the next two or 300 years. Okay. Well. My view. Oil, no, no, oil no, sooner. No, no, that's fine. I think what you'll have instead is you'll have um, 
the world needs to think about the climate impact of these things and think about when does it use oil and what for, when does it use gas and what for, and when does it use renewables and what for, and nuclear. That's, that's, that's the question that's coming. Um, and, and, we all, and we all need to be part of this discussion because quite often it's like, well, this is all the oil company's fault. And you say, no, I don't really think so. We, they're not, they're not, you know, it's everybody's fault because we're all doing things better or worse than we, we could be doing. So. Right, Mike. All right, well, that was just a base to say thank you very much for a really good talk. We've had a good overview of uh, many of the technical aspects of, uh, of your business. And uh, we learned something about the different aspects of risk. And I think you've left us with a clear idea that uh, life is ever-changing and that risk is ever-changing and the, the nature of the different risks is ever-changing. And I guess that's what makes it such a very fascinating business, um, which you've demonstrated to us very clearly. So many, many thanks for that. <laughs>